Welcome to the Cardiac Emma Learner Series, a unique video tutorial program under the aegis of Indian Association of Cardiac Imaging. This program is focused on beginners and intermediate images with learning happening through short sessions and case-based discussions. We are grateful to experts from different parts of India who have helped us in putting this program together. Please do feel free to give us your feedback so we can continually improve such training opportunities. This session is brought to you by Dr. Richa Kothari, who is a consultant cardiothoracic radiologist in Narayana Institute of Cardiac Sciences, Bangalore. Her areas of expertise include cardiac CT and MRI in adults and children and thoracic and vascular imaging. She received the 2018 Regional Award by the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging in Barcelona, Spain and holds a Level 3 certification from the same association. She has won multiple research presentations at national and international level and is an Executive Committee member of the Indian Association of Cardiac Imaging. She has co-authored multiple textbook chapters and is part of the DNB teaching program. Hello everyone, I am Dr. Richa Kothari. I am a cardiothoracic radiologist working at Narayana Rudaila in Bangalore. In this video, I will be talking about a relatively newer cardiac MRI technique called parametric mapping. The objective of this video is to learn what are these cardiac MRI parametric mapping techniques why do we do these techniques, what is the physics behind the technique and its clinical applications. Cardiac MRI as we know is used to differentiate cardiomyopathies due to its excellent spatial resolution and high tissue contrast. Late gadolinium enhancement that is the LGE sequence is a reference standard for diagnosis of these cardiomyopathies based on the pattern of enhancement. The pattern of enhancement helps to distinguish between ischemic and non-ischemic as well as between the various forms of non-ischemic cardiomyopathies as we can see in these images. However, the late gadolinium enhancement does not detect diffuse fibrosis because there is no reference normal myocardium in such cases. Parametric mapping techniques help detect diffuse myocardial structure alterations. They are a non-invasive tool to quantify myocardial tissue composition. Let's see how. T1 mapping quantifies T1 relaxation time. T1 relaxation time is nothing but time taken for 63% of longitudinal magnetization to recover. T1 relaxation time differs between two tissues substantially like edema, fat. So the pixel wise illustration of these absolute T1 relaxation times on a map is T1 mapping which gives both a visualization and quantification of the myocardial disease process. So how are these images acquired? Look and Locker proposed measuring T1 relaxation time by acquiring images successively after magnetization inversion. However, over the years, multiple improved methods have come, one of which is the MOLLE, which is the Modified Look Locker Inversion Recovery Sequence. It measures T1 times over a single breath hold over 17 successive heartbeats using the 33335 protocol. What it means is, after an inversion, it acquires images for 3 successive RR intervals followed by a recovery period of 3 RR intervals. Again, inversion and acquisition of images for 3 RR intervals and recovery period of 3 RR intervals followed by inversion and image acquisition for 5 RR intervals. The difference between look locker and MOLLE is that images are acquired in the same cardiac phase in MOLLE 
so we can map these images and get a quantitative value following molly some of its variations have also come one of which is short turned molly or shmolly which as the name suggests has a short turn breath hold which uses the 533 protocol other pulse sequences are also there like sasha and sapphire which also can be used to acquire native t1 maps these native t1 values are influenced by field strength the sequence used to acquire it by the gender of the patient hence they have to be specific to the local setup each and every institute needs to derive its own normal values for native t1 one advantage of native t1 sequences is that it can be used in severe renal impairment because we do not need to give gadolinium to acquire this images also contrast t1 mapping is done at our institute we usually do it at 15 minutes post contrast administration for uniformity so this sequence is very variable it will the values differ based on contrast dose time between contrast administration and scan acquisition renal clearance etc hence usually ecv extracellular volume is used which is a ratio of t1 values and is more reproducible t2 mapping is nothing but quantification of t2 relaxation time t2 relaxation time is time acquired for 63% of transverse magnetization to be lost so the pixel wise uh, distribution is t2 mapping so it is an objective quantification of myocardial edema t2 mapping values are raised in acute myocarditis acute myocardial infarction acute cardiac transplant rejection there may be some artifacts due to through plane motion resulting in signal loss however use of t2 preparation based t2 mapping sequence is better for avoiding this artifact t2 star mapping will be covered in another video in this series native t1 values are reduced with lipid and iron overload and they are increased in myocardial edema fibrosis or infiltration which is summarized in this table let's see some examples there is shorting of t1 t2 and t2 star signal in iron overload in this case we can see the short axis lg image shows no enhancement there is reduced native t1 values and we can see progressive signal drop with increasing echo time in this t2 star sequence t2 star is the reproducible recommended parametric mapping technique for iron overload t1 may detect mild early increase in cardiac iron but it is not very specific ecv in such cases may be increased fabry's disease is an intracellular lysosomal storage disease in this case we can see that the short axis lg image shows no myocardial enhancement the native t1 sequence shows reduced native t1 values as we can see on this scale that it must be around 1100 milliseconds at our center the normal t1 native values is around 1250 milliseconds in male and 1280 milliseconds in female so in this patient there is low native t1 in fabry's disease low native t1 may be seen even before development of the lv hypertrophy so it especially helps to distinguish bet between other lv cardiomyopathies in many cases of fabry's we may see enhancement along the inferolateral wall in such cases we may see pseudo normalization or even elevated t1 due to replacement fibrosis ecv in such cases is usually normal because it's an intracellular storage disease this is the case of chronic myocardial infarction where we can see near transmural enhancement in this lg short axis image which shows corresponding areas of raised native t1 and ecv the areas of lipomatous metaplasia show reduced native t1 and 
ECV. Acute myocardial infarction usually shows high T1 and ECV, which is amongst the highest of all cardiac disease, which is likely due to disruption of the cell membrane. In this case, we can see near transmural enhancement in the LG short axis image, which shows raised T1 and ECV. However, there is an area of microvascular obstruction on LGE, which shows low ECV because it does not pick up contrast. Amyloidosis is an infiltrative cardiomyopathy which shows higher ECV compared to any other cardiomyopathy. In this example, we can see diffuse typical subendocardial global enhancement which shows corresponding raised native T1 as we can see on this scale. The values here were around 1500 milliseconds of native T1 values. Similarly, this uh, is seen in the ECV map with very high ECV. T1 native uh, helps clinch the diagnosis in cases of amyloidosis with difficult myocardial nulling on delayed enhancement images and in renal failure patients where we want to avoid giving gadolinium. T1 is elevated in patients with AL amyloidosis even with absent or uncertain cardiac involvement. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients show raised native T1 and ECV values due to cellular disarray and extracellular matrix expansion. In this example, in this short axis LG image, we can see LV hypertrophy with patchy mid-myocardial enhancement. This is a three-chamber image which shows systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve with flow acceleration due to the LVOT obstruction. We can see that native T1 values as well as the ECV is raised. This is one factor which helps to differentiate it from athletes who have a usually normal T1 native and ECV values and also from hypertensive hypertrophy. This is another case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where we can see that there is no significant enhancement on the LGE image. Here we can see in the three chamber image the systolic anterior motion with flow acceleration due to the LVOT obstruction. Even in cases with no LGE, the T1 native and the ECV values are increased. This may help in diagnosing early cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a case which shows apical transmural enhancement with mid-LV hypertrophy, suggestive of burnt out apical uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The LG image of the mid-cavity shows no myocardial enhancement. Even then, the native T1 value at the same level is raised. In dilated cardiomyopathy, Late gadolinium enhancement pattern helps to differentiate between ischemic and non-ischemic causes of dilated cardiomyopathy and also to further characterize the myocardium in cases of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. In this case, we can see a typical linear mid-myocardial enhancement in the anterior wall and septum with further epicardial enhancement. There are corresponding areas of edema on STIR image. In this native T1 image, we can see a similar pattern in spite of not giving contrast. And the ECV pattern is seen even better with a typical mid-myocardial enhancement. This is a case of dilated cardiomyopathy which did not show any myocardial enhancement on LGE. In spite of that, the native T1 and ECV values were raised. 
So large portion of our DCM patients, in spite of not showing any enhancement on delayed enhancement images, show raised native T1 and ECV values, which suggest diffuse fibrosis. So this helps in risk stratification and further optimal management of these patients. Myocarditis is myocardial injury due to multiple possible causes. For example, infections like tuberculosis or bacterial or viral infections, autoimmune disorders like sarcoidosis, SLE, Jogren syndrome, or toxic causes like alcohol or certain chemotherapeutic agents, etc. So, diagnosis of myocarditis is usually by the Lake Lewis criteria which consists of conventional MRI findings of edema on T2-weighted sequences, early and late gadolinium enhancement. However, parametric mapping T1, T2 and ECV sequences are more sensitive for identification and quantification of this myocardial fibrosis and edema than LGE. It may even detect myocardial enhancement when these conventional uh, sequences fail to identify the abnormalities. Another additional uh, advantage is that these sequences can uh, display the typical non-ischemic patterns similar to LGE even without contrast agents as we saw in an earlier case. In this case, we can see near transmural and epicardial patchy involvement of the myocardium with similar corresponding areas of edema on stir. The native T1 sequence even without contrast displays a similar pattern where we can see raised native T1 values which correspond to the areas of LGE. The ECV is also raised in these patients. Transplant rejection is another important indication for doing uh, the mapping sequences. Transplant rejection shows raised T2 and ECV values in acute cardiac rejection. So this can help reduce the frequency of endomyocardial biopsies. Native and post-contrast T1 values are not so significantly different in patients with acute rejection and with no rejection. In this example, the short axis LG image shows no significant enhancement. This is the T2 mapping sequence which shows raised T2 values. Then in this case, the T1 and ECV were raised. Cardiac parametric mapping has been proven of use in cases of amyloidosis iron overload, Fabry's disease, myocarditis in studies so far. It appears to be of potential use and there are multiple studies undergoing for its utility in cardiomyopathy, ischemia infarction, congenital heart disease and heart failure. So to conclude, cardiac parametric mapping quantitatively detects myocardial composition. It helps to pick up focal and diffuse myocardial disease even in the absence of myocardial late gadolinium enhancement. In multiple cases it not only helps to diagnose but also helps to prognosticate the disease. Local normal reference range is necessary. Each and every institution needs to develop their own. Hopefully, it may replace late gadolinium enhancement and endomyocardial biopsies in the future. These are some of my references. Thank you.